interesting. All right, thanks for joining us for a special broadcast with Talking Hedge and Canvas Legalization News and J.J. McKay from the Fresh Toast. And Thomas, of course, the co-host. <laughs> What's up, JJ? Not much. What's up with y'all? It's so great to have the country's reopening up and people are barreling forward in their business. Yes. Yeah, you got your shots? Yes, I do have my shots. I got the Moderna. Oh, well, I got the Pfizer. J and J. Sad. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, any shots is the best shots. Yes. Yes. I'm not asking. I questions. still had a mask on the plane, <laughs> you know, uh, and I don't like having to mask on a plane. Active masking stinks. You know, you have to eat. Put it back up. Four hours took me to get from uh, St. Louis to uh, Seattle. In 20 minutes. Four, yeah, it's a four hour and 20 minute flight. I only fly if it's a four hour and 20 minute flight. <laughs> but the good thing is, is we're helping others. And that's the most important part. And we're reducing the stress of us. All those poor people have to work on the planes. Yeah. God love them. What a, yeah. what a tough job right now. Mm -hmm. Or Amtrak. But uh, how's the fresh toast going? Fresh toast is going great. We're thrilled by how things are going. We are... Uh, we're doing some more things, you know, just for everybody knows we're a media content company that produces probably some of the most con most content in the marijuana and medical marijuana space. Plus, we do some other cultural um, uh, content and then we take it, run it on our site, share it with our 1.5 million uh, social media followers. And then we syndicate it out to newspapers uh, in the U.S. and Canada. So about a million people are exposed to our content every day. And so we feel we're we're help we're helping the battle as um, as North America begins transforming and looking at cannabis in a very different way. Nice. Yeah, I remember when you guys did your uh, uh, launch party out here in yeah. Seattle. Uh, I just thought it was neat. 2017. Yeah, yeah. So you've been four years into it now. Can you believe it? Yeah. So we're, and, we, and hey, look, and we came out of cannabis standing because a lot of people closed during. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, some sad, some deserved, but look, you know, we, we keep our eyes facing forward and we, try to be very responsible and try to do, we try to listen to our consumers. Sure. sure. What was one story that you uh, saw or wrote or, um, you know, read last year during the pandemic? What's one story that you saw that kind of sticks out in your mind for one reason or another? You know, we wound up doing other, a lot of follow-up from this, but the number one story that we saw was I watched the today show. You know, we, I watch a lot of mainstream media um, and it said a third of people were willing to trade, uh, to give up a sex life for a good night's sleep. Oh, geez. And so that's for us, because we do such a great amount of medical content. Let us know that people were really stressed mm. and we spun off a lot of stories about sleep, relaxation, sex life, um, ways, entry ways into, Hey, you know, you just don't have to sit there by yourself and get, you know, smoke a joint, yeah. have a quarter of an edible and see how that works for you. Oh, yeah. And we saw a lot of uptick. Oh, one some of our biggest stories every weekend is the entry into the system and how to exit out of the system. You know, mm -hmm. how do I get stoned the first time? What happens if I get too much done? And, you know, yeah. and it's a, and we constantly have to repeat those stories of, you know, the worst, and for, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people, worst thing can happen, you're going to fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've noticed some mild paranoia when I'm really, really stoned. Um, I'm not sure. Is anybody? Is it just me, or does anybody else get like kind of paranoid when they've had too much? I have a, I have a, a, a very close person in my life who gets paranoia, um, but he only gets it with joints. Oh, yeah. so I have provided him edibles, and he does not get that with edibles. And in fact, in edibles, it's a more multi-sensory, joyful journey for him. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I would suggest changing up how yeah. you do things. Yeah. Certain cultivars will give me, like we were just at Sitka, um, a hash company and they have green crack and that always, that particular strain gives me, uh, it makes me edgy, like not angry, but, but puts me on edge. It's yeah. just weird. So it's not really anxiety necessarily, but it, it, it hits me the wrong way and I just have to steer clear of green crack. Uh, plus the name is just ridiculous. Anyways, I heard Snoop Dogg created that name. Really? Green yeah. crack. Mm -hmm. For the paranoia you're talking about, isn't that more of also too, like the cannabis is known to like, uh, accelerate your heartbeat and you know, that's that paranoia coming into that, well, that feeling of, uh, let's roll it all back and be practical from since the beginning of time, we had the same type of effects with alcohol, you yeah. know, the whole song tequila makes her clothes fall off, Yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. 
you know, drinking tequila makes some people aggressive, drinking beer chills some people out, rosé relaxes. You know, we, how we mentally process with what's something new in our system sometimes doesn't always affect the same way. Same way. I always joke with people who smoke, I, you know, I smoke to calm down. Well, yeah. you know, you're making your heart go like three times faster, yes. right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if, if something makes you paranoid, start experimenting with other stuff. I found that I'm allergic to alcohol. I mean, I, I drink a lot and I tend to puke on myself and, you know, wander oh. in strong places. I, I'm, I'm seriously allergic to it. So, note to self, don't ask to go for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to. It's five o'clock where I'm from. Uh, I, I was going to blame it on terpenes. Do your readers really care about like terp profiles or, or flavors? So, and Josh has heard me say this before, you know, the, the number one way that Americans get buzzed is via beer. And 51% of America drinks Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light, in that order. They own 51% of the beer market. Wow. So the answer to that question is no. What do they want? What you know, how do people buy wine? Price, label, recommendation. In that I was order. gonna say label. Absolutely. Yeah. Label's number two. Yeah. And it's funny because if you talk to restaurant people, um, they will say that the majority of people order either the second highest or the second lowest price of bottle of wine because they don't know how to. And so they go with whatever the cost is. They don't want to seem to be the cheapest. Yeah. And if they think if they get something semi expensive, it'll be good when they're really they don't know much. That's kind of the secret to your media mm -hmm. success, right? Because you appeal to a more broader audience of the, the, the newbies like you said you have to repeat the stories about like no one's died from cannabis like no uh, how to start it and how to stop it right. yeah sleep and sex yeah so i've you know i've spent pre-covid i spent the two years pre-covid doing a lot of talks in um, the alcohol and restaurant industry and it's it's very fascinating because you know the, everybody's really worried about cannabis but when it boils down to it um i pulled out a lot of really great information that the average person doesn't realize. And we work in industry that's an industry of full of sommeliers trying to talk to the Applebee's customer. Mm -hmm. And oh. there's a huge disconnect on that information. And that and, and you and in the passion is very different. Yeah. So I asked because I had you know I had a room of like 400 people and I said, let's do a quick survey. Who has more influence on alcohol or on, on the purchase of wine? Wine Spectator and Wine Magazine or Hoda and Jenna from the Today oh, Show? Mm -hmm. Hoda and Jenna. 99% said Hoda and Jenna. And they can say, we can see trends when they push something. We cannot see print trends when they push something here. Because from a mass market point of view, that's where it is. Yeah. There's always going to be this high-end model. There'll always be Tiffany and Hermes and so forth. But when we launched, I had a lot of my social girlfriends, especially in LA, are like, he's going to be the Vanity Fair. I'm like, mm -hmm. uh-uh, we're the USA Today. And they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where all the money is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd rather own. I would rather own McDonald's than per se. Sure, but you could have at least, like, you know, placated them and said, like, <laughs> "But for you, we'll do exclusive special stories." I'm like, thanks. <laughs> anyway, all right, all right. Back to how to sleep with weed, yeah. <laughs> which is a huge story. It's a huge story. And we don't do like any that. of that on cannabis legalization. Yeah. Was... you don't sleep. Oh, no, there's very little sleeping. And then also we don't talk about strains for sleep or strains for sex. Maybe we did once on Valentine's Day in passing. But uh, ours is usually more uh, how to get the license, states that are moving forward on legalization, terrible atrocities about prisoners, which is just it, it's our worst rated stuff because nobody likes to you know be reminded that this mm -hmm. is still uh, a criminal enterprise and people are being punished. And even with the Schumer bill, it was a Swiss cheese bill that says, yeah. if it's here and you're legal, fine. But God forbid you'd go to Indiana and try to do that. Well, you know, you have to look at part of what we do, though, is change the mindset of the nation. And that's where things could happen. Yeah. You can have extreme activists who are carrying the old school banner of I'm a hippie and I'm a disruptor and all this. And that's not going to change in America. America needs something that makes them comfortable. We love comfort. That's that's what's going on. I remember when we, about a year or so after we launched, we were in the Daily News and we were doing well. And we were at some event. And this jackass is like, well, we're going to do something with Vice because you know, Vice is, you know, blah, 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 yeah. blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, great for you. And he's like, why are you around? I'm like, just remember, out of the 
200 channels. Vice is like 197. Yeah. And you know what number two is? ABC or WG. This is no, this is cable. Oh, okay. Uh, WG and I said, so people would rather watch a law and order episode repeat that they've seen eight times and see new content on vice. Sure. But the thing is, if you can get people to understand if the, that law and order crowd to go into it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. We need a dun dun bumper. Yeah. Dun, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun. But you're like the the antithesis of, of high times. Like high times was the uh, like it, 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 we we make fun of them earlier because they're not what they used to be. But uh, this they happen. I have the high times magazine. Oh yeah. Keep having your dot conversation. Well, I'm just saying because like 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 high times and is like it's not what it used to be. You know, it early days of the culture when when it wasn't outlaw culture. Yes, yeah, in the car. <laughs> uh, you know, it was. When it was good, when there was, because that's the, what the market was. It was, it was all smugglers and it was all, uh, it was naughty. Growers. It was all naughty. Yeah. It still it's has a center of culture. It's got a centerfold for weed still to this yeah. day. It's weed porn. But yeah. like, yeah, but the early days is when it was more significant because it seems they, they've, but there was, away. there wasn't, a, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't the industry that goes on like this. Yeah. And, and for it to be what, what everybody has raised money to be, it has to be mainstream. It lost its relevance, though. It's not It's not necessarily mainstream, in my opinion, anymore, because people aren't growing. It used to be the Growers Magazine. Now that you can go into the store, they haven't switched to become culturally relevant in the way that Dope Magazine did. High Times bought them and then buried Dope Magazine. Yeah. So if we're going to normalize this, how do you anticipate the Fresh Toast kind of being a part of that? If we're going to normalize it, how do you not bring the sommeliers and the altruism to the mainstream that doesn't really care about that. They just want the, um, uh, the results, you right. know? So once again, I always say the industry kind of looks at itself in a vacuum. So let's look at a bigger picture. Can you name the top 10 wine magazines there are? Oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's make it, let's make it easier. Can you name the top five vodka magazines there are? Cool. I had no idea that there was going to be a quiz, <laughs> but I'm not ready. I have always been very good at contemporaneous <laughs> answers. So I'm going to say vodka quarterly. <laughs> There's Das Poor. Uh, and, and then I'm going to say vodka uh, because that's, that's the German, not the German. That's the Russian pronunciation. Um, so no, when it goes mainstream, you know, the problem is, is high times could have high times if they had perhaps had a different leadership model, mm -hmm. um, could have become much more relevant and, and integrated themselves into a big movement. But we, in today's world, we we gather our information and from sources that we trust. And we like to go to places that give us a variety of our interests. Mm. You know, as we talk about high times dying, so as so is model railroaders. So is all these hobby yarn tomorrow, you know, all these type of magazines are dying out. And when you look at the distribution of them all, they're small. Part of that is they didn't embrace digital early on. Yeah. And part of that, that movement has moved on. And now I could see it in a variety of other ways from a TikToker, from this, from that. Yeah, yeah. So you have to stay relevant based on what your audience is looking for and give them more than just one piece of information. Not, not, not that line with the relevance and an online shit, like, that's where I fortunately got like lucky. I think where where I'm at. Like I didn't start out trying to be a a, a podcast guy with this lawyer, from, you know, from Chicago. I, I asked him to do it because I was broke. But you know, it's like like <laughs> I started early on with the internet. I, I had some friends, you know, online. I met these guys online. I'm like, hey, uh, this this website which I call now the Brickweed. Uh, uh, but at the, at the biggest point, we were hitting a million unique hits a month. Yeah, more, more that's than which times, is great. Right? It was all online because we were one of the ones, like early days, if you just had marijuana.com or weed.com, you'd get a bunch of hits all over it. But oh, yeah. the culture has evolved because you you have that, uh, like you're taking that daytime, your audience is that daytime mom who you're trying to achieve the, the, the purchasers. And there's still, though, that subset, the culture people, you know, like high times won't appeal. They kind of still appeal because they have events and they're still got a legacy name, but there are still many other websites that are like, like the grower websites on YouTube have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And like some, like we talk about policy, we're like in the middle, you know, and then you have other people who are trying to come out and they're. Well, look know. at the, you know, here, and that's why you have to find partners. Yeah. You know, we're happy. We, we run legal stuff because people are interested in that. It's a, it's a subset of our content portfolio, but they do that. But you have to understand these growers people. I mean, how many of you have run into a, 
college kid getting out of college. Oh my God, I'm going to raise some money and I'm going to have a grow farm. And they know jack about it. They're subscribing to all these sites. And then they realize it's a lot of work and I need to raise like $2 million. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, Whoa! <laughs> That's right. People, I hear people all the time. I'm going to invest in a grower because I'm going to give them a dollar today and I'll get 10 tomorrow. Mm. And then they get all into it. And then they realize this is, this is hard. Yeah. I'll never forget. We about right before COVID, one of our investors asked us to meet with this guy who runs a family office and he comes in and he's like, yeah, yeah, whether we will meet you soon, I'm going to send you, we're not going to invest in you, but we want you to look because we're looking at doing our first major seven figure and uh, first major weed investment and it's seven figures. So they send me and it's grow farm. Mm. So, you know, I look through the deck, blah, 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 blah. So he comes in and he's like, you know, you know, suit, tie, you know, he's, you know, kind of talking down to me. He's like, yeah, I just want to, you know, I'm just clear that we're not going to give you any money. You know, this is, our, but we're doing this. And, you know, this looks like a cool cannabis company and the family's really into it. So what can you tell me about it? I'm like, well, my first thing to know is, is anybody in the family or anybody in your firm familiar with commodities or farming? And he does this. I want us to value each other's time. And I would prefer if you stick on top. Whoa. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'm sorry. He's like, yeah, I came here today because I want to evaluate the stack. Look at it. And I'm like, well, that's why I'm asking if you have anybody in agriculture or commodity background. And he's like, I'm not sure that's relevant. I'm like, you know, a grow farm, you know, a grow operation is a farm, right? And you yeah. grow the weed. Wow. And all of a sudden you could see this light hit up on him. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I was aware of that. I just didn't look at numbers. I'm like, anybody can give numbers, but unless you are familiar with agriculture and the and the and the tr triumphs and trials of a farm, you're not gonna really understand that model and how commodities vary from you know, avocados cost three dollars, you know, one month and three months later they're a dollar ninety-five. Yeah, you know, so you have to be aware of that. And he was like, Oh, I found out later they did not make the investment. Well, the um, team too, right? You got to look at the team as far as the experience they have with the grow because you just have a bunch of newbies. I mean, the growing, you can start with 100 plants and then end with 80 because yeah. whatever, commodity, agriculture, like you're saying. So you have to really be, you have to think about that. You know, our thing is we appeal to the main audience and we're helping change that. So, and I think Josh and I've talked about that because, you know, he's so brilliant. Um, when you look at trends, so you go all the way back on how things change. Now, no one would have thought 15 years ago, that gay marriage was would be possible in three lifetimes, much less the acceptance of gays now. But what changed that whole thought process for the nation was Will and Grace, the TV show, because it made it made it not scary. And it, people invited into their home. They laughed with it. They felt comfortable with it. And then that's what allowed the process to change. And they didn't make it derisive. Right. Towards it. But... When you see weed portrayed in the media, you see a lot of derisiveness, or at least um, making fun of the people that are using the product. We'll, we'll get we'll get there in a second. Okay. So then the next major trend that changed was S and M. So when Fifty Shades of Grades came out, per capita, more books sold in the Southeast than anywhere else. Mm. And friends of mine at NBC and ABC said. That means that America now has a higher tolerance of s and discussions. Mm. And you may remember mm. that Ellen and Matt Lauer from the Today Show were going back and forth and they shared like some, you know, mocked up s and for, and, and they said they had almost no complaints. They said if that had happened pre Fifty Shades of Grey, they would have been flooded with it. Mm. Hmm. But we become culturally norm to it. And that's what we're working at. Now, when you look at gay versus weed, if you remember pre Will and Grace, every gay character was a stereotype, mm. you know, and it was soap and, you know, all these other things where it was just, a, Will and Grace was the first one that made him look like, you know, they made Will look like the guy next door, yeah. the neurotic bumbling attorney that could be your neighbor in yeah. a suburb. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's what evolved it. And when you look at some of these TV shows, you're starting to get them, get them all. I mean, look, the biggest transformation that shows that we as a country are changing our attitude is Fox News now covers weed as a business story, not a cultural story. Mm. Mm -hmm. And and Fox had two years ago released that the majority of their viewers are pro-legalization. And CBS came out, I think yesterday, with a poll that says 91% of America is okay with weed being legal. Mm. About the same amount of people who believe in more gun regulations. Congress, though, tends to run behind it. Mm. Yeah, those gun regulations have just not gone anywhere. Yeah. And a lot of kids have died. Yeah. yeah. 
do you, do you think that hidden uh, market that you've been hitting, I like to say hidden because it's people who don't venture into cannabis until it's legal in their state, like medical. You know, I, I noticed out here in Washington when it became medical, uh, lots of people who never consume cannabis, older people, uh, you know, like, oh, my God, this is great. This is the first time I'm doing it. I don't know why I was holding out because they're waiting for it to be legal. That's who you're waiting is that who you're <clears throat> to? You know, 80% of people are rule followers and they're not and they don't go and they don't or I would say probably 90% of people are rule followers. They're not innovators, uh, maybe in a small portion, but they're going to stay within the main system. Yeah. You know, they're going to go to Rick Steves. They're going to go to Applebee's. They're going to buy La Crema. Mm. They're going to buy all these things that are the mainstream type of stuff because that's what other people have said to do. Yeah. When it becomes legal, more people will experiment and it'll do well. Now, unfortunately, what we're seeing what's happening in California and Washington is those people go to the legal market and try it out. But it's confusing and there's way too many choices and no one's really helping them. And it's more expensive because of the tax system. Yeah. And so they're dwindling down and they're buying illegal weed now because now they think it's OK. And they have a guy who is a friend of their kids who's like, oh, I'll hook, tow you, hook you up. And they're like, I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they do it because, you know. Peter brings over once a week a bunch of, you know, edibles or brings over some pre-rolls and they don't have to do it. They don't have to worry about like at some places where it's like going through a cheesecake factory menu. Like, yeah. oh, whoa. <laughs> well, like New York market, before it became legal, they had the the, the, the the delivery, you know, aspect for a while there. And, you know, people just show up like a high maintenance, you know, it was just like that oh, yeah. people were showing up. Then it became legal. Now they're they made fun that. of that in 1999 yeah. when they made the movie uh, Half Baked with Dave Chappelle. The guy, the weed guy, came to their apartment and like knocked on their door and said, "Well, I have you know mediums. I got high quality, and I have I have Reggies." And, and that was a, a a delivery system that they did completely illicit 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, and and you know, and you know, going back to the mainstream, now you can go to. Generally, if you go during a prime part of the day, you can go to the grocery store, talk to the guy who's in charge of liquor and said, look, I just want a white that's fruity and isn't too sweet. Here's your five things. That's what America wants. Yeah. America doesn't want a whole shelf because we're like, that's right. I got ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of the you know, the green flower media has created this Gangier certification, which may help fill that gap, provided that somebody at the retail location isn't just saying, we got a bucket of different SKUs here. We're like a Greek restaurant. Our phone book is also the menu uh, and could like say, well, what are you going for? Well, what types of flavors do you like? Well, what are you going to be doing? And then if you're going to be doing those and you like those flavors, this is the weed for you. Yeah. Then they don't have, they've, they've had somebody who's helped them and they don't have to make a decision may explain why they enjoyed having their friend come over. Cause he just had a thing. It's like, yeah. well, there's one choice. I love it. You know, or there's, here's five things. I know them all. And if you have a bad experience, I'll walk you into something else. Because mm -hmm. the other yeah. thing, people find a hard time going to the store and say, hey, what I bought last time isn't yeah. what I want. How much of your content does, obviously, I imagine a good portion does, designates to that person who just walks in and wants the four choices. But how much of it's also devoted to the bud tender that is going to give that information? Do you devote any time to like the education? Yeah, stuff? There are probably 40 people, 40 publications who do that. Yeah. And that's not really our specialty because... All of our content is automatically syndicated up. Mm. And so we, we're very clear that everything that we do has to be syndicated. It goes out into syndication. Sure. For, you know, to a newspaper or to Smart News, to mm. Apple. Is there so a, it's all, it's all consumer-based. Yeah. Standards and protocols and procedures? Are there regulations for what the Associated Press is looking for in syndicated news? <sighs> Funny you should say that. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, there is. We are very lucky to have on our board the former head of ABC News. Oh, wow. And so we have very strict um, anything that's medical, anything that is recommendatory. We always have a, a, a link and we do some non cannabis medical, but we all of our all of our medical has two links that go to studies to make it sure it's very clean. Yeah. Um, but we also, you know, we have a standard format. Here's what it looks like. It's always, you know, we, we make it very clear. And part of the reason we got to syndications, it took us um, to our public facing syndication. It took us, we had one partner after nine months, which was the New York Daily News, but Tribune took us two years and they watched yeah. us for two years and they watched our performance with the New York Daily News. Mm. And then we also syndicate content out to 
uh, a closed list of 80% uh, of America's practicing physicians. Okay. And they also waited two and a half years and then they gave us very strict protocols. So everything you say, while it looks kind of lighter and fluffier, it's actually a very clean piece of content that can stand up. We have not had, we had one, our Canadian partners, Post <coughs> Media reached out to us and said, so it's, so, 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 so. and so I sent them the information. I'm like, here's all the information to back our story. And that, that was it. Is that because it seemed like an opinion or? No, it was, you know, they get people just complain. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, we get very few complaints directly, mm -hmm. uh, but occasionally we get them through our news because, you know, our reach is one thing. Our newspaper partners reach is much larger. Oh, sure. I like the long sales cycle too. It just, you know, kind of reminds me of the cannabis industry in certain uh, respects. They waited to see if you die. So like, you know, to all those would be cannabis media companies tuning in, get used to waiting and seeing if you don't die before somebody will actually buy your stuff. Well, and you know, this is about Google. Google waits to see if you're going to die. Yeah. I mean, Google, it, Google has time, hidden time zones, but after about eight months and about 17 months, they begin treating you differently because you they look at how consistent you are and what you're doing. And then they begin to treat you differently. Yeah. Like an authority. Yeah. Uh, I like the fact that you brought up Google because, uh, uh, you know, that's been key to like uh, where I've been at, like my Google ability uh, with the activism. You know, I've, I've, I've just known like the algorithm or whatever. It's like I've been trying to appeal to, like the general public when I first started writing and everything was kind of with the stories of like, hey, we're just citizens. It was none of that hippie championship. Like it was just more like you should be mad, too, because I'm mad. You know, the, you know, I'm just your neighbor. You know, there's a chance for us all to go to jail. This was early, been blogging for now 10 years. So, you know, there's enough arrest and raids going on back then that enough people get upset about it. Uh, but uh, uh, I just still think there's that, um, like I said, you're, you're, you're appealing to the broader market. And then when I, when I was doing mine, it was more towards like the, the heartstrings of anger. You know what I mean? Like that's where the activism, the, my focus has been like the raids and the, not the, the society, which. So. If you're asking my advice, which yeah. you're not, but I'm going to give it. No, I, I really am, though. <laughs> you know, write your stories like you'd be on King 5 or the Today Show. Mm. Because, because you're not going to move a huge amount of people into anger based on this. Yeah. This is not in... We partner with Brookings and John Hudak, who's amazing. Yes. Um, and right before the election, the, right before the midterms, um, they did a survey and weed is not, while the majority of America wants weed, it's not in their top five concerns. Right. You know, it's security, it's job, it's all this. Uh, and so there's a, now when something happens like um, the rot, you know, all these unfortunate deaths around um, uh, police brutality and so forth, that rallies people. But even those numbers are minuscule compared to the population of the yeah, country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is those stories come out, Hoda, Hoda does that, and ABC News does that, People Magazine does that. And then people say, you know what, that is wrong. Yeah. And so they mention it at a, you know, the next time they're at a family gathering and they tell their congressman, you know, we need to do better. Sure. And so that you have, it's a slower, it's turning a, it's turning a battleship. Yeah. But in doing that, you're engaging all this other stuff. And that's what we try to do every day. So if you tell those stories, more people will share them around. Because yeah. once again, 90% of people don't want to be out front. They want to be part of the public opinion. And the more you show, it's part of the public opinion. Yeah. We talked about uh, high times and losing a little bit of relevance. How do you continue to stay topical and, and try to pivot to stay relevant with your topics and, and two part question, what advice do you have to uh, a new entrant, whether they're coming into the East coast or, or writing or creating a, a new publication? Uh, is there anything that you would do different? And what advice do you have for them? I, um, I would say that if you're looking at starting a new cannabis magazine, don't. Um, and because it's as it goes to legalization, others will be absorbed up. You will have yeah. a cannabis column in the New York Times. You will have you'll have more lifestyle stories. You'll have how to eat a gummy bear on the Today Show. You'll have all this stuff that goes out there. And it's it's and so you have to be up with relevancy because a chunk of these people and I can name three examples in our industry did it as a way to get a bunch of investor money. And then they're like, I'm going to walk away with $100 million dollars. Mm. And that's just not the case. And it's not, it's the same with Model Railroader. Um, and there's a, and there's some really good, you know, there's Green Market Report that's great in business. There is Kenneth.net, who's really great in uh, the stoner popular. There's us. You know, there's some really good, good magazines out there right now. 
but the industry just can't so you, people don't want that many specific yeah. magazines anymore yeah you know you go to youtube and you have your youtube channel but most people don't watch it right. you know i remember years ago um a friend of mine was in the video industry and he was doing a deal mm -hmm. with vegas for video at uh in all the hotel rooms the on-demand video oh wow um and vegas has a primarily male population that goes to visit and so you know we got to talking about adult videos hmm. so do you know the average length of watching an adult video five minutes seconds <laughs> four minutes and 20 seconds you're close to seven minutes there holy shit, what are you champions well they have to get into it first they have to believe the uh the no, fantasy no yeah. it's not that they have to get they get have to get to the moment they find the most exciting yeah yeah but but that also goes to show we have a short Yes. Kind of, I mean, you look yeah. at things like smart news, Apple news. We all want things in, and we, and we can get, do about eight stories and then we want a new topic. Yeah. So you have to be constantly thinking about that. Now, your first question, how do we stay relevant? I have three major partners who tell me that sometimes, yeah, that's not working anymore. You need to change that. Mm. And then we also get feedback from our readers. So we get back and we get all these things of what's working and what's not and all that stuff. So we get this analytics every week. Okay. Um, early on, because we have a diversity of, of stuff, Apple must have had some fight with other people because we did some royal news and outside of the cannabis and our cultural area. Mm. And we, for about six months, were the second largest royal news uh, segment of Apple News. Wow. Well, then all of a sudden it went away like in a day. Huh. And so they must have been having some negotiations with some other bigger players. And then we've never gotten that back. Mm. So it's also, you know, we're just, we're always like, let's try this, let's try this. Well, we tried this two years ago, let's bring this back. Mm. So the one thing that we've never done, and it's funny because when you look at all the analytics, both our social media analytics and our, our reader analytics, is food and wine are really the most compatible. Mm -hmm. to our to what we write okay and that is the one area where we just we've never connected we do great with uh relationships sex you know pop culture all that sort of stuff yeah that is one area that we have consistently fall flat at. what's your opinion on why um maximum yield is that what it's called there's there's a maximum yield was a, a grow magazine and then there's maxim magazine which is a fitness magazine right um you can name a dozen other ones why do you think they failed and what makes you different well you know we're right here in public for, <laughs> so let me we see how hit the editing floor. Yeah. <laughs> let me just see um how can i say this some people when a lot of people enter enter into this industry in all variety media products and all that with an intense sense of passion, advocacy, and entitlement. Mm. Well, why wouldn't you give me a million dollars to start this? Because this is a great thing. And let's not focus on this. We've got to get our story out. Um, you know, I can name, and I won't hear, I can name three um, magazines that raised millions of dollars and had no business plan. Mm. But they were part of the bro culture and it was private planes and big parties and all this other stuff but never had a way to make money yeah uh, but because we're the next big thing cannabis is hot blah 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 blah. they kept doing this and then then it all fell apart so they didn't have a real business plan right no no, no so they, they were just burning money and then yeah. you also it's also a numbers game okay two years ago they were legally let's even say illegally there might have been fifteen thousand. 20,000 growers from this big to this big. Oh, sure. Okay. Now let's think about that. How much are they going to spend in advertising and how much are they going to spend to help you grow? Very little because you're not allowed to deduct that advertising dollar. The IRS will audit you. Well, not only that. And so let's say you have 20,000 growers. So that's 20, let's say 20, yeah, 20,000 easy number. Now each one of those growers need five key things. They need lights, they need manure, they need, you know, uh, uh, some uh, infrastructure. Yeah. So let's say there's a hundred thousand. So that's a hundred thousand. You know, custom, they're going out and making a hundred thousand purchases every year. Sure. Okay, now you have all these lights. Well, you know, these lights are going for a very specific country. And you know, you go the last big Canacon here. There were like ten light companies. Yeah. Yep. 
and you know, which is tough. Yes. And it's tough to make, you know, and do you do, and you know, it's like TED Talks. It's like, you know, it used to be the TED Talk, and now like, yeah, I gave a TED Talk. What was your, uh, uh, my TED Talk was South Berean. <laughs> <laughs> You know, how many of these conferences are you going to go to? We have more, the this industry, okay, so they're thinking in the next two years we'll be a $30 billion industry. Right. Alcohol is a $238 billion industry. The weed industry has twice the amount of meetings in the alcohol industry. Mm -hmm. And currently, the weed industry is the size of Subway sandwiches. We It, it generates the same amount of gross cash as Subway does. So you cannot constantly be building business after business after business after business on top of this. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have some non-cannabis streams of revenue. Well, even people see the green rush, though, and, and with the media side of things, because I think you've done well to, to, to aim for that middle of the road uh, of, the, of the content. But then, you know, I was thinking more of the, the Googleability, back to that. Uh, like Megan 420, you Google it, you'll find things I've been doing for 10, 12 years, you know, advocacy articles and other websites and everything across, you know, like I got a good footprint. But like your your writers, I imagine they're all known people because like when I started doing this, it couldn't just come out as Miguel. I had to come out as Miggy 420 or I wish I had a cooler one like Method Man. Like I really wish I had a cooler one. But, you know, it's what I got. It's what I did. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the markets are still you have your middle area, but you still have the growers and you still have the culture. You know, there's still a, a wide sweeping thing, but we're at the point too. Now you can Google a person. I, I'm very big in subject matter expert. Like that, that, that previous website I was on, there's a bunch of names on there. Like, you're like, this is not really a person. You're, you're only a web website with one article. This is, there's too much uh, ghostwriting, too many, uh, uh, contracting out to somebody. And Google looks at that. Yeah. But it, it also shows like, but if you look up somebody, I, my point being is just if you're going to take a, uh, uh, someone's uh, advice, it should be from someone who's in a position that you already want to be in, not somebody who's, you know, Joe, the homeless guy, you know, who just started his uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I love that. Because <laughs> when you see two homeless guys walking down the street talking to each other, you know, one of them is giving the other advice. <laughs> and if they were smart. That other one would be like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have a home. Yeah, seriously. But no. they don't. They're like, that's a good idea. But cannabis is big with that. We have lots of people throwing money into it who who, who are throwing money at people who have no experience. No, no. As they do with cryptocurrency. Mm. Hey, if they as, got they, a license, as they did with the derivatives. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there's a there's time, you know, there's time. For, I'll never forget the very first uh cannabis conference I went to in, in Vegas, and it was fabulous for a variety of reasons. But I'm at this party. I'm talking to people. I'm, oh, you know, we're about to launch this. He's like, are you looking for investors? Yeah. He says, well, what's the return? I'm like, yeah. he's like, no. He said, see those people over there? And it was some traditionally good-hearted, classic, traditional cannabis growers. You know, this couple, you know, they were just like, we're here to sell good weed. And that's our mission in life. Yeah. He said, see them? I'm like, yeah. And he says, they're, they're expanding. And they have this wonderful opportunity expanding. I'm loaning them a million dollars. They have a balloon payment in 12 months. They will not be able to make it, and I will own their upper. I will own a twelve million dollar grow for a million dollars. And I'm like, that's, that's cold. And he that's, says, that's, that's business. Yeah, that's business. Yeah. 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 And so the cannabis industry is transforming that way too. And Seriously. and it's a fault of his. It's also a fault of them. Yeah. 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 You know, you got to. You know, this. You know, we're, it, this isn't 1950. And hey, gang, let's build a barn. Yeah. Right. And. Yeah. You know, and when you look at farming trends, it's Archer Daniel Midland and all this other stuff. A third of our food is on the West Coast just grown in California because Ooh. the fires, food prices are going to go up. That was yeah. in the news the other day. So you have to understand the economics to it all. And, you know, you can't wish, you know, you can't wish things to happen right? because it just doesn't happen that way. It's business. There's a rec shop owner here in Seattle who's gotten a really bad reputation uh, for owning Uncle Ike's because... In order to keep the distance, there's a thousand foot distance uh, for schools and churches and whatever. And so in order to keep uh, a competitor from opening up within his neighborhood, he put in a pinball machine, which is attractive to kids. And so therefore you can't open up anywhere else. And so uh, that was his way of kind of keeping it. So people thought that that was... Um, a lack of altruism and that it wasn't about the cannabis industry. And I'm scratching my head going, this is business. Yeah, why? Yeah. I still don't understand why people hate uh, Ian Eisenberg of Uncle Ike's. Uh, they call him racist. They call him a businessman. And I don't, I personally haven't seen anything racist 
and all I see is business, but you have all these altruistic people yeah. who think that he should be giving away free cannabis when this is a business. This is a commodity. This isn't yeah. even medicine anymore. Well, this is a, the medical market is dead. Ian, Ian fell out with the crowd because he saw cannabis as a business. Yeah. Selling weed is a business. He didn't early on here have that we're changing the world the hemp, come up from the hemp fest and all that that's all that's going on east yeah. of the mississippi it's all social equity on the east coast well, and then that federal bill from schumer was all social equity so if you give people free stuff they don't know what they're doing yeah, yeah. well and here's the other thing is we all talk about social equity 90 percent of this industry is run by white men yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and the people who are talking about social equity and making it legal white, white men yeah. and the people who are backing it white man hmm it is uh, i i just did another story on this you know i um well i'm a white man i'm also gay um and it's and i'm definitely outside the circle and i've seen a lot of women outside the circle hmm. and i almost when i go to meetings you just really don't see that many people of color who are in the circle hmm. Mm -hmm. and i've and, and and even in our own field i've seen people straight bros raise millions of dollars and then close yeah. mm -hmm. and it, it, who had no business plan. It was all a bunch of this. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't grow a single gram and they raised seven, seven figures and couldn't grow a single gram. Yeah. I've seen mm -hmm. it. And again, if you don't Google the person you're about to give money to, I don't feel bad for you for losing your money. <laughs> I mean, this is why I developed that, that writing, uh, uh, my original intention was to travel the country and, and, and do like uh, covering stories like people in prohibition states, you know, being the guy from oh, yeah. the, 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 but, the without an, but without an outlet, that's, that's a waste of money and time. Right. Right. If you don't have an audience, why do it? Exactly. And well, that's why Unless it's your personal passion project and you don't need money. Well, it's all both. Right. Yeah. I mean, like if you can uh, find a job that you like doing every day, you know, you're not I, I like but doing it, my <laughs> job. It is still a freaking right. <laughs> well, and you still need to make money. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's and that's part of it. You've got to figure a way to make money. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's what I was talking to him uh, yeah. during Prop 215 when medical was coming about. That was used against medical, right? They're like they had to be non medicine. Yeah, it had to be non profit. That was the California model, and yeah. maybe also the Washington State's uh, medical model. I'm not. Sh I, I'm well, not the, the, the feeling that. behind it was yeah. kind of like that. It was, it was not you had. It was in the regs, like like Harborside. It had to be run as a non profit. Yeah. And a lot of those Californian things had to follow that, and so it. It well, is California isn't really the, I would say, the star model that we would have called. No. Colorado has done a great job. They've reduced their black market. They have a cap on things. And they've, they, you know, the only problem that happened in Colorado is they got saturated because everyone, it, the people made good money at the beginning and everybody else thought they'd make good money. Yeah. And they so, also, uh, they're vertically integrated very by the start. So they had the 70 30. And so that's really one of the reasons why I think Colorado has some of the lowest prices in the country. I like how Michigan's doing it. They do bifurcate. You can be vertical, but they only really have the three licenses. Like they have the three license types here in Washington, grow, process, retail. Uh, and then out East, you're seeing more shadows of what they're doing in Colorado. I'm sorry, co not Colorado, Colorado. California with the various types of license classes, including nurseries and transportation, wholesale distribution. Well, and part of that is, is, you know, governments see it as a way to make money. Yeah. I mean, you're and and Lord knows I'm from the South. I love the South and I love New Orleans, but you have to understand New Orleans is the only city in the country that bankrupted the mob. Mm. When they built, when they originally built that casino at the bottom of canal, there were so many people who put their hands in the casino's pockets that finally they had to stop and go back to the city and say, okay, just come up with a number. Oh, I can't, you know, we have someone in Kenner from the school board who's like, I need a little something over here. And you have someone from Gretna and they're like, <laughs> you know, and after a while, even the mob's like, wow. well, I think we've been showed a lesson. <laughs> that's funny. Oh. And that's why it took them something like five years to open that place because they couldn't get all it was just a hot mess wow. so you think that's what's going to happen to the uh some states are just going to miss the bus and then they're just going to have walmart that's selling weed because it was just too crooked and they couldn't get their act together. hold up I, I, on that question have you written any stories about how in california they're bypassing the rec model where it's direct from producer to consumer because that's going to end up screwing everybody all these oh, license yeah. holders over yeah wow. well we have done we've mainly done stories about how california's model is um not destroying the is hurting the is both hurting the industry and promoting the black market mm -hmm. 
and that they need to get their act together on that. Because that's the first time I've heard of it. It's not even technically legal, but there's no regulators stopping it from happening, from my understanding. So to be a producer processor selling directly to the public is phenomenal because you're going to be making two to three times more than you would because, at least in Washington, they're taking 3x over your wholesale price. Mm -hmm. If you can avoid that, you're going to be selling a lot more product. Well, um, Steve D'Angelo Steve and I have a disagreement on this particular topic. You have to look long term. You're you're building a whole new industry. Yeah. The last time we built a major industry like that was 1920. Video. Oh, video. video. Mm. All of a sudden, we came out with these. We built a product. Then we had to, you know we built the content. Then we had to product size it. Then we had a net retail outlet, blockbuster, oh, yeah. so forth. Okay, within ten years, that model changed. Blockbuster and Hollywood Video, you know, started yeah. with mom and pops, just like in the cannabis industry. And all of a sudden, you had these grainy and only a certain amount. Then all of a sudden, you got all these other products. And all of a sudden, it was you walked in the store and it's like way too much. Do I what I want? Da 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 da. And then all of a sudden, grocery stores got into it. Mm. Redbox, wow. right? Redbox, yeah. or or just buy, renting and buying videos in the grocery store. Safeway there used to be a whole section, a Safeway yeah. or Kroger or Seven yeah. Eleven. Wow. And then that hurt all the mom and pops and began hurting Blockbuster. Well, then the next thing that happened, then comes streaming, yeah. screwed it all out straight to consumer. Which is exactly what you're talking about. Mm. That's what the, you know, the Amazon model. You want something, here it is tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, you have to look at that stuff. So I always try to encourage, look, the cannabis industry, because of our size, is not going to make ginormous federal regulation changes that we want. They have to partner with people who have other vested interests. Yeah. And who are the three other industries that have vested interest in our industry? Tobacco, alcohol, and food? Pharma. Pharma. Mm. So now, what are three of the top lobbyists in the country? Tobacco, alcohol, and pharma. Yeah. They're the ones who are talking to Schumer and so forth and helping build some laws because those laws are helping them. Because at the end of the day, when it's federally legal, Uncle Ike's is going to struggle because you can buy it at CVS, Walmart, yeah. and QFC just like you buy every other product that's similar and that in at the end of the day that's what the consumer wants the consumer wants to go in and get ice cream cookies mm -hmm. chips weed and a bloody mary for the next month yeah, yeah i don't want to make two trips <laughs> <laughs> I, I ask people all the time how many specialty beer stores do you go to there's one specialty beer store that i know of on up off of war yeah mm -hmm. I do like the, the craft brew, though, and I like how there are certain regs, and especially the micro-business license with a delivery endorsement in uh, Massachusetts. I have a client that we're putting together decks for him. It allows them to do that so they can uh, grow, process, and then website order direct con to consumer and deliver. But that took three years of a whole bunch of people you know, really making a lot of a stink to get this type of direct-to-consumer model. But I mean, uh, if there was limitations on canopy size, I don't see why you can't have a type of license like that where, you know, just like a tasting room, you're just allowed to have that one dispensary where you're allowed to sell that product that you've grown there. Uh, that would be a welcome uh, license type, in my opinion. I think that could but be. Let's, you know. let's look at three years down the road. So COVID, mm -hmm. more people drinking COVID than any other time in, the, yeah. in, in recent history. Mm. Thousands of beer companies closed. Mm. Wow. Hmm. Now, why is that? Who runs the beer company? The um, the distributors and the brands. You can't sell liquor and beer through most places across the U.S. without going through a distributor, mm -hmm. Southern um, and all the other types. Yeah. Um, wow. So the way those all those craft beers made money is through their tasting rooms, their in-person events, you know, in-person yeah. event type mm -hmm. of thing, buying it directly from them, and right. occasionally a few specialty shops. Well, once you couldn't go to a restaurant, mm -hmm. they didn't have the operating capital. Most of them didn't have an operating capital, and they closed. Now, mm -hmm. they began then finding other ways to go, buy a case to go, support us, go fund me, all that sort of stuff. And But they, you know, significantly reduced. And if they had high overhead, like a guy rent or something, they closed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, and... Budweiser, Miller, and Coors had their profits dipped a little bit, even though there was more use. And do you know why that is? Cannabis? No. Mm -hmm. Well, they that dropped because that's in California. People want to oh. use weed Monday through Wednesday. The most profitable beer is event-based beer. Uh, Bars. Whoa. Ball games. It's, it's kegs. Kegs are a lot yeah. easier to sell 
the uh, bottles and cans. It's like bio- bottles and cans cost a lot more to produce, yeah. distribute, process the whole bit as opposed to cash. And what's sure. the price point and the profitability? Because if I go buy that beer, it's a Budweiser because they have such large market share at a bar down the street, it might be four or $5 for that pint. Mm-hmm. If I go to the Seattle, uh, uh, what's the name of the baseball team? Mariners. Mariners, Mariners game. Uh, that's going to be a $10 beer. Mm-hmm. And so that that profitability has to at least get some goes to the bar or the, the brewery. I mean, some probably goes to the people that own the um, uh, ballpark. But yeah. So let's so let's let's say that. So you get let's go say we go to the Hobnobber after this for you're going to get a four dollar bill. Mm-hmm. Budweiser. Mm-hmm. How much is a six pack at Kroger? Right. The eight, ten, ten, eight bucks. Ish? Yeah. Eight bucks. Yeah. Right. Cheap. So. They make a lot more money you buying it at the Hobnobber than you buying it here, and that's why they do do so so much effort on draft. Mm-hmm. Well, There's an interesting license type out of Michigan called the marijuana temporary event license. Hmm. So that would be fascinating to see the the data on that. Now you use to get, to obtain one of these. There's a couple different types. One of them would be the retailer one. So you'd already have to have your dispensary license to be able to get that next level. But uh, and then there's another one where you're just going to have an event where there's uh, consumption on it. Uh, but yeah, that's that'd be nice. That's, that was going to be the frontier for the uh, the consumption lounges because we've got a Class C felony in Washington State to maintain and operate a marijuana lounge, and so yeah. wow. the workaround that we were going to when I wrote the bill for that was using that language of having temporary event licenses. But there's a lot of pushback on that. But hmm. I'm bound for loopholes. Oh, yeah. Consumption lounges are not going to be a thing. They don't make very much money, uh, and you know they're not going to be a thing. If you have you have to yeah if you have to serve food then all of a sudden you're competing with some place that serves food right what if a woman doesn't want to do that and you're not buying in bulk so let's say let's just use things let's say we go to the hobnobber again yeah mm-hmm. and and we don't have anything well we're gonna go for one drink usually that winds up with maybe two maybe even three sure or maybe two and an appetizer you go to a consumption lounge you get one joint you're there for two hours yeah Especially today's joints. We got some wonderful <laughs> joints yeah. that were wrapped in a half a gram of hash. Brought that to you by. Gonna take <laughs> I'm going to be smoking that joint until I'm 40. <laughs> Crap, I'm 41. <laughs> it's a good joint, buddy. Yeah. But so yeah. You got to think about consumer behavior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to say two things. Because you guys talk about that, that the market's worth a keg. Uh, it's also uh, resembles uh, with the, the sodas and the half meal. You know, like yeah. when, you, when you get the, you know, the, they get more money because the, the doesn't cost that much but uh the other thing with the uh the california when they're doing that that mark is there so they're not even asking a license you can only be a business a a grower a processor and there's no transfer license no no nothing huh no not that i'm aware of but it's like i said it's it's uh something that they're able to get away with it's it was never intended for producers or processors in california to sell directly to the public but for whatever reason they're doing it because of the pan, I think because of the pandemic and with the delivery access and, and that whole push um, that you might as well just sell direct. And so they're not even waiting for this distribution license. Mm. They're just selling directly without any recourse. Right. Needs. I mean, that, but that's always about cannabis, right? There's always the gray area that people like step their toes in there and try and make it. Well, see yeah, what a happens. lot of that gray area just comes from the lack of understanding of the plant and the just terrible laws that we have regarding right. it. So the, the, the laws and the, how bad they are really do reflect mm-hmm. how poorly understood uh, the plant is by the population in general. Uh, I mean, if everybody knew about cannabis as deeply and as detailedly as we did, uh, the laws would be fundamentally different. And that the industry would probably rival alcohol because it would literally be that substitute good effect. Or, you know, I got a backache. I don't want to take any Advil. You'd reach for a very uh, specific type of dose that yeah. you know and it's, and it's effect. So it's going to be interesting. And that was the story today on the Today Show. Yeah. This yeah. morning on the Today Show. So those type stories are what's changing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there was vets in the Today Show yesterday, too. Yeah. They were an advocate for marijuana. So they're, they're, they are pulling in that segment of people, but they're not like, like, like you said, they're not being avid, a, active as far as like, this is wrong, it's fucked up. It's more like they're presenting their, their story and just saying this. And is, that's what you, and because then people feel, yeah. and, they, and the more people feel normal, the more likely they are to use. Right. I mean, you go in to an Uncle Ike's or a, particularly have a heart, which had a brilliant model because they had the best store and in Belltown for tourists. Yeah. And you see, you know, mom and pop from Minnesota and they're like, 
you just thought we were trying out of the Wanda trip. Right off the cruise liner? Yeah. They're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're so nervous because they're, they're going to on the take one. And they're going to take out. one chocolate. And they're like, you think, well, I'm like, yeah, you know, what are you, you just stick it in your purse and not going through your purse. <laughs> and they're wrapped. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I, 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 you know, I know people who have flown with it and they're like, oh. so I'm like, it's wrapped. It's not like a drug dog's throwing you down because you have a, you know, a chocolate gummy. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So let's uh, maybe wrap this up with some crystal ball predictions. What do you anticipate uh, for legalization? We saw a lot of speculation in the stock market between October and November. Uh, a lot of, you know, retracement and profit giving since then. Uh, pot stocks aside, what is your expectation for federal legalization? What is your crystal ball prediction for the industry 2022 and beyond? What are you seeing? Well, just framing that, like we have one of our readers, Sri Ram, who lives in Seattle, who lets us know that he's a big fan of edibles, but he's also a big fan of vodka and rice and chips. And he's never advocated for the other three. <laughs> Not, rice and chips and vodka never try to put him in jail. <laughs> you don't need to advocate for it. Yeah. But just as many people go to jail for vodka mm. than they do with weed. But after the facts. After the facts. Yes. So we have to pay for COVID. And despite everything, there's a, there's a lot of states have a lot of gaping holes. And even states with hardcore Republican governors are having to look at it from a financial point of view. So the big two changes that will happen, though, fundamentally without federal legalization, which I think will come sometime in 22, is interstate commerce and banking. Mm. Once those two things happen, you're going to see a significant change or the hope of a significant change. Now, we've written stories about California and Canada. What happens is you have this huge upswing in the market beforehand because you have people like the Tilray people and stuff like, oh, give us, some, you know, we're going to be worth, we're going to be worth, we're going to rival Apple. We had one company say, we're going to be as big as Domino Sugar. And I'm like, God, we're going to sell as much candy as that. I'm like, oh, you're going to be selling to kids on Easter. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have this huge update. But as we saw with California and in Canada and everywhere else, once it happens, you have two to three years of, regulation coming in yep. and we do an incredible, you know, we work with 80% of America's doctors and we, we work with like 50,000 doctors every other week and we get feedback is they're not going to medical marijuana. Isn't going to be a thing until it's FDA approved. And most importantly, it has a reimbursement code. Oh man, that'd be insurance. awesome. So once that happens, it will be as big as you know, other stuff. Now it'll move into right now it can move into, but people, most people won't don't go there because the consistency still is not there. Mm. So what I predict is you're going to have a bumpy 20, the rest of 2021 with 2022 going into it. And either the industry gets in front of it and builds better partnerships with alcohol and pharma and tobacco, or they're going to write the laws. That's going to make it really difficult for leaders in the industry to overcome that. Yeah. That's how the banking industry does it with an SRO. Their self-regulatory organizations are the ones that write the bills for the industry, for the banking industry, to make it too complicated for senators to understand what's going on. And that's why the banking industry is able to get away with what they do. So we need a self-regulatory organization. The NACB is one of them, but they're not moving fast enough to create an organization that's capable of doing that. So hopefully something gets figured out because that's exactly what we need. Well, do you think a lot of that problem too, though, is a lot of the out-of-state people like Washington State when it was medical? There's a big problem when you've got people successful in the thing, pulling in revenue. They don't want to like be friends of everybody else and, and join forces and, and, and create a coalition. They, and that's the and that's the problem. Look, there's yeah. an avocado association. Mm. If the avocado people can get together. Seriously, <laughs> Seriously though. And the, all the all the ranchers are part of beef. They all fight, but they're all, they come together. Yeah. And, the, and if you look, if you really look at the people who are heading these national organizations, they're about as milk toast as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, MPP did a great job when they hired Stephen. He is a great guy and he appeals to DC. You've got to appeal to Congress yeah. to get things done. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that is, and that's, you know, and that's what we work on every day. We try to give props to some people for what they do. We try to slam Florida for what they're doing. You should. But... <laughs> It is and Georgia. Slam Georgia. That is terrible yeah. what they're doing there. Well, I'm talking just specifically with weed. 
Well, so is I. Their medical is terrible. Oh, I'm talking about how 71 percent of their voters voted for it, and the oh. governor stopped that. Yeah, that's I mean, more that's, along the lines. That's, that's that's like South Dakota. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's horrible. Yeah, and yeah. you know because you're 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 starting to say we went into run a dictatorship, and, yeah. and we're Big Brother, and we know better. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. so so we work on we do share those type stories, and we write them in kind of funnier ways, like five five ways you know the governor of, we have oh. written this, but we're going to write this next week. <laughs> <laughs> the five ways the governor of uh, Florida said, I don't care about voters. Mm. Oh, yes. So um, so we try to do things like that because those things like that get shared around, even by people who are moderate or like, yeah, mm. yeah. because people feel passionate about something. We, we had a, and I know we're wrapping up, but we had a woman call us up, this PR person, and she hounded me. I mean, she was like a dog with a bone every day. I, I'm doing the most eco-friendly, green, pro-cannabis, uh, packaging for the industry. It's going to be revolutionary. You know, it's done by angels and a unicorn has licked it. All this. And that's just not the stories we do. We don't do this business story. Five days every day. You didn't respond to my email. Da, 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 da. It's every day, day, day. I get a phone call on Friday and she has tracked my phone number. She's like, I'm not sure you're getting my emails. I'm like, I'm not even sure who you are. Oh my God. And she's like, I'm doing this revolution. I'm like, before you say another word, just remember, 87% of America has ice cream in their freezer right now, and not one of them called their congressman to say, we need better ice cream packaging. No. Seriously. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yeah. until yeah. ice cream packaging is like, that's one of the problems though with weed packaging is that it's, uh, and we'll get bottles and cans. And so, like, as long as it's recyclable, recycle it. Look, I think packaging in the weed industry is great because it's the same as the candy industry and it's the same as the alcohol industry. That you don't need to write. If you want to spend money, spend money helping make it better sure. by engaging Congress and working and partnering with people who partner with candy, partner with alcohol. Mm. How come the uh, the beer that I can go buy uh, in a can, that's not childproof? It pops open real easy, and and that can get the kids drunk and they could die. But that weed that I'm going to go buy has regulations that say that it has to be in an odor-proof, sealed, child-proof container. And you're oh, limited wait, 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 wait. you can buy. So you say there's a discrepancy between cotton candy vodka that you could screw right. off and drink and the fact that there's no law, you can't have cotton candy gummies anymore? Mm. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that was even in wow, the federal that's bill. Pretty, that's pretty insightful. In the federal <laughs> bill, you're not allowed to have flavored vapes. I get I get cornered because I get to a variety of parties. I get cornered at cocktails parties. What you're doing is wrong, and I'm like, so you say with it, and I'll literally say this: so you say with a drink in your hand. Yeah, that's bad for kids. You can't oh be God. kids are using weed. And I'm like, and um, they're not using weed, and they're like, I'm like, so explain. So what you're saying is, is we need to punish parents for having open alcohol, and we need to put safety tops on all the alcohol. Well, I didn't say that at all, and I'm like. I, I'm confused at what point you're trying, that what ground you're getting on. <laughs> Next time, like, kind of look at their shirt, like there's something in it. And when they're like, what? Oh, your hypocrisy is just showing. <laughs> well, you know, I'm very Southern. So I mean, I'm always like, I'm, <laughs> you're too help me understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from oh, Illinois. Sorry. I'll just tell you how it, I think it is. And then if you tell me I'm wrong, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> versus seattle we're just super passive aggressive and we'll just tell you we'll hang out with you and never show up again with the seattle freeze yeah that's how we roll <laughs> oh neat all right so i guess with that we're gonna roll this one up i want to thank my thank you so JJ much McKay, no. fresh toast jj where can they find you at what are your links uh we're at thefreshtoast.com we're at get fresh toast on twitter and instagram and we're on the fresh toast and fresh toast news on facebook awesome and you can find uh, the Talking Hedge at the Talking Hedge, and Canvas Legalization News is uh, all over the place. Podcast and YouTube channel. That's right. All the podcast providers and the YouTube channel, Cannabis Legalization News, and soon CannabisLegalizationNews.com, because we're not heeding his advice. That's it. <laughs> all right. So with that, I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out.